Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second in our Sacred Conversation Conversations series. Sorry. Uh, my name is Nicole Johnson. I'm one of the Associate Directors for Partners in Health and Wholeness. And if you've been joining us for any of our virtual events, you know that we've been having these events as a response to feedback from you, from our partner faith communities. And so we are very excited to have mental health um, be one of the conversation series that we are able to offer because it was number one in some of the previous feedback that we have received from you. And so I also want to mention that this is only part one of a two-part series around mental health. And I invite you to make sure that you mark your calendars for July 24th at 11 a.m. when we'll be joined by Reverend Do Dr. Don Baldwin. La, I'm having, okay, all right, let's try that again. <laughs> by Reverend Dr. Don Baldwin Gibson, and she will be leading part two in this mental health series. Um, today, we're gonna be having Reverend Jessica Stokes, who is um, a great colleague that works for Partners in Health and Wholeness, leading the mental health series for today. Um, I do want to point out just a few things. At the end of each event, we'll continue to ask for your feedback as we continue to refine the series and think about what it is that we can offer you during this time that would support your faith and health ministries. And also during, um, during um, the event, we invite you to uh, put your questions or requests in the chat. Um, there will be points when we will unmute people and we'll let you know when those moments happen. Um, so, but feel free to put your uh, questions, uh, requests in the chat. And after the event is over, you'll also be able to send us an email or things that you thought of that you hadn't remembered um, as a follow-up to this event, or if you have questions or recommendations for future events. So, with that, I'll turn it over to the rest of the PHW team and thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Brewington and I am the Opioid Response Program Coordinator for Partners in Health and Wholeness. And I'm gonna lead us in our opening prayer. So let us pray. May our time today be a comfort and a confrontation May we find peace in this time of tumult, and may we invite tumult, tumult into our lives of peace. May we find calm in this time of restlessness, and may we allow restlessness to evolve into action. Let this be a place where we consider what we have never considered. May our time together bring dreams of new ways of being in the world. Amen. Good morning. My name is Reverend Karen Richardson Dunn, and I am also an Associate Director of Partners in Health and Wholeness. I am facilitating our new Healthy Aging Initiative. I just want to welcome all of you this morning. We're so glad to have you. And I would like us now to um, engage prayers of the people. I'm sure most of you are familiar with prayers of the people. Um, it is call and response. So throughout the prayers, I will be using the phrase, uh, Lord, in your mercy, and I ask that you will, you will respond with, hear our prayer. Um, it will be up on the screen so you can follow along. Um, during the prayer, at one point, we are going to unmute everyone so that you can speak yourself, uh, your concerns, your prayer concerns, um, the name of someone who is on your heart this morning, or a joy, because we really need to hear that expression of joy right now. I think we can all agree on that. So if you would now gather with me in prayer. Loving God, you make your presence known to us each and every day as the one who is near the brokenhearted and who saves the crushed in spirit. Yet in a time such as this, we acknowledge our hearts are broken by the violence and injustice and illness of our world. Our spirits are crushed by the oppressive weight of divisiveness and uncertainty and fear. 
our bodies carry the trauma of these and other wounds as sleeplessness and anxiety, depression and inertia, and self-destructive habits and mental illness. And yet, God of infinite mercy, you taught us to pray, and you promised that we would receive all that we ask in your holy name. Here now. Here's the deal. You don't want to make oh, a mask. We just need to have your name and phone number so that when you get sick and you go rush into the hospital for help, <laughs> and she's say, oh, you're the one who said don't wear a mask. And here you are, you're ill. See, I don't want to <laughs> Lord, in your mercy, and your right. prayer. See, but I'm a bad person because I'm saying, you know what? You don't want to do it? Fine. But don't come looking for help. Sorry for that interruption. Can we continue with our prayer? Absolutely, Karen. For our communities, for the poor and oppressed, for black and brown bodies destroyed by violence, for all those who suffer hatred because they have been deemed as other, for an end to unjust and unworkable systems based upon greed and racism and fear, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. For those who have and are suffering from COVID-19 and those who have been lost, for their loved ones, for the bereaved and the lonely, for our healthcare workers, and for our young people who face such uncertainty, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prayer. I now invite all of you, we will be unmuted, and I invite all of you to share your own prayer concerns or a joy or just speak a name that's on your heart this morning. Over Barbara, my cousin Barbara. In these Jacinta hearts. Sturgeon. Andre Stanford. The good family. For mental health concerns. The Higgs family. The Harborough family. The wisdom of the wisdom instead of always trying to give solutions. Is there anyone else who would like to to speak a concern or a joy or a name? For Tammy and Robert and Eric. And I have someone in the chat box who has asked um, for prayers to for I want I want to name this for Lise and Phyllis and Joe as well. For Shirley, for Mia, for my family. For the Anderson family. For the Anderson family. And Marion and Jim Hartman. For Marta. Thank you. Thank you for sharing these, these names. Guide us now, beloved God, by your spirit, that all our prayers and all our lives may serve your will and show your love. Speak healing and restoration through the words we are about to hear. Speak freedom from the burdens of fear, anxiety, depression, guilt, shame, and anger. Speak to us now of love, peace, freedom, wholeness, joy, and thanksgiving. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Karen, for that beautiful prayer. Um, 
<clears throat> My name is Lindsay. I'm the Communications Associate at Partners in Health and Wholeness. And before we dive into the presentation, I'm going to share some logistics with you all. Um, so please, I just want you all to take a moment to familiarize your, yourself with the toolbars on Zoom. Um, we're going to be we, we won't be continuously adding information, but we might add a couple of things to the chat box. And if you have questions, feel free to add it there and we'll be monitoring that. Um, we ask you to please keep yourself muted throughout the call unless we prompt you to be unmuted. Um, that will help us kind of um, help with echoing or any other background noise that could interrupt the presentation at that point. And right now I am sharing my screen. So you'll notice that um, in the corner of your screen that there is a little box with faces. And at the top of that box, you should have about four options of different views. So the second option, that thicker looking um, bar that you see, that's the one you wanna click if you would like to see the speaker who is speaking at that moment. And then you'll see in your bottom toolbar, you also have options um, of unmuting of, um, and please don't mess with that unless we prompt you, and to start and stop your video. And you'll see the chat and a couple other things. And if you have, please, if you have any questions, um, just put it in the chat and we'll make sure to address it. And with that, I will pass it on to Reverend Stokes so she can get us started. Hello, good morning. Uh, it's great seeing familiar faces and names, and thank you for joining us today. As it has been mentioned, uh, this is the continuation of our Sacred Conversations series, and my name is Jessica Stokes, and I'm one of the Associate Directors of PHW with a statewide focus on mental health advocacy. So I'm honored that you're joining us today, and as we look at what it means to be a trauma-informed faith community. As we begin, I want to offer as a reminder and as a centering to check in with yourself throughout this conversation and to take care of yourself. Uh, inadvertently, talking about trauma and community engagement around trauma can bring up our own difficult seasons and what we carry. So please take care of yourself as needed. And as Nicole mentioned earlier, I just want to emphasize that this is a two-part series. Today, we will cover the basics of trauma-informed care and applying this to worship and the life of a faith community. This, like all fruitful things, is hard work. And today is offered as a starting point and as encouragement. Uh, we are all learning together. And uh, we will have a second part to this series on July 24th at 11 a.m. And that will feature Dr. Don Baldwin Gibson, who actually pastors a trauma-informed church in Eastern North Carolina. So today we'll go over the basics, get us familiar with these phrases. And then in July, please join us again uh, for a deeper look at this topic. And finally, before I begin, I am convicted to share uh, that PHW, we, we love doing this work with you all, and, and part of that is doing life together, and with that, we recognize that racism to be a form of trauma. We realize and we seek to understand how racism fuels health inequities, such as lack of access to care, mental health resources, quality insurance, and much more, and especially how racism, uh, either direct or vicarious, leads to lasting trauma. So PHW, we are, with our best intentions, we are working for the peace and justice of all North Carolinians, and we are holding that in this conversation. I wanted to share that as we begin. Uh, next slide, please. So to begin, it's imperative that we define what is trauma. Uh, before we can get to the action steps, we need to start here. The American Psychological Association defines trauma as any disturbing experience that results in significant fear 
helplessness, disassociation, confusion, or other disruptive feelings intense enough to have a long lasting negative effect on a person's attitudes, behavior, and other aspects of functioning. Traumatic events include those caused by human behavior, such as rape, war, industrial accidents, and as well as by nature, earthquakes, and often challenge an individual's view of the world as a just, safe, and predictable place. And also any serious physical injury, such as widespread burn or a blow to the head. So I, I utilize this working definition from the APA, American Psychological Association, as a working framework for this conversation. There's a lot of definitions of trauma, uh, but we, we are choosing to use this as our guidelines today. Um, next slide, please. And with that, there's all kinds of forms of trauma. I'm sure uh, we can name off quite a few. So today, to cover as much ground as possible, what I thought would be the most digestible is to think about individual trauma and community trauma. Now, of course, there's all kinds of other traumas that fall under these categories. And we will talk about many of those, but today we'll, we will focus on individual trauma and community trauma uh, so that we can best apply this to our ministries. And so the APA definition that I just provided about trauma is a good working definition for what is individual trauma. And under that, I want to highlight a phrase that many of you might already be familiar with. We've been talking a lot about this in the life of PHW, and that is ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. And so what are ACEs? Adverse childhood experiences are traumatic events occurring before age 18, but also noticeably during the first 2,000 days of a person's life. So we're talking about from birth until kindergarten. ACEs include all types of abuse, neglect, as well as parental mental illness, substance use, divorce, incarceration, and domestic violence. A landmark study in 1990 found a significant relationship between the number of ACEs that a person experienced and a variety of negative outcomes in adulthood, including poor physical and mental health substance abuse, and risky behaviors. So essentially, the more ACEs experience, the greater risk for these outcomes. The lasting toxic stress uh, that happens during ACEs inhibit healthy growth, emotional, mental, and physical growth. And ACEs can rapidly harm learning, memory, social skills, and can cause depression and anxiety, uh, hormone imbalance, immunity, uh, poor immunity, and overall physical health uh, detriments all the way up into uh, adulthood and later into adulthood. So the impact of ACEs is, is huge, and I'm, I'm highlighting ACEs as an individual trauma category, uh, as well as community. It kind of floats in both. And so secondly, then I want to bring up community trauma. That's hugely important in our conversation today uh, for churches to, faith communities to consider community trauma. Uh, the Prevention Institute, this is a resource I'm going to highlight again later. I'm going to go ahead and bring them up, has an incredible resource on community trauma that I highly recommend. There is a publication called Adverse Community Experiences and resilience, a framework for addressing and preventing community trauma. And I have a resource page at the end of my presentation that highlights this resource, but if you get a chance, Google uh, the Prevention Institute and you can read this on your own time. But this, but this uh, publication looks at community trauma through three an anchors, equitable opportunity, people in place. And so what do they mean by equitable opportunity? That includes thing, things like intergenerational poverty, long-term unemployment, relocation of jobs and businesses, limited employment and disinvestment, 
uh, maybe uh, disenfranchisement. So those sort of things, uh, we see that often, unfortunately, in rural communities. Uh, when when uh, a booming business shuts down, but the town stays and, and so forth, you all understand. And then by place, or by place, what do they mean? Deteriorated environments and unhealthy, often dangerous public spaces, unhealthy products, uh, public resources like clean drinking water, uh, access to healthy foods, uh, those are considered. And what do people, the category people means disconnected or damaged social relations and social networks. The elevation of destructive, dislocating social norms, a low sense of collective uh, political and social efficacy, which is interesting. So in these categories, as you hear and as you can see, community trauma has many forms uh, from distrust, and local leadership and local entities and, and uh, things all the way to uh, natural disasters like hurricanes and storms. We see plenty of those here in North Carolina. I know I've worked a lot with you all on that. On that. Also gun violence, collective loss, jobs that do not pay a living wage, lack of access uh, again to uh, public resources. And it's important to note that what one faith community experience is in a larger community may not be uh, the same for a faith community just down the block, per se, and that's because of due to things like race, education levels, income levels, access to uh, health care. And so it's important as we think about how to become a trauma-informed faith community to think about all the ways the trauma and types of trauma enter our lives and enter our community lives. Um, next slide, please. And so with that, trauma can be subjective. And so what is highly traumatic for one person might not be for another person. Trauma, trauma is a process. It's not something that happens in the past and then it's suddenly over. Uh, people experience trauma with intrinsic vulnerability factors such as coming into traumatic experiences with different sets of coping mechanisms, different sets of tools, different sets of genes, family of origins, uh, ages, as we've already gone over, childhood trauma is different as it happens in a developmental window. Uh, so who experiences trauma? Really, it could be anyone. It is incredibly common and not equally distributed throughout society. So it, that's, it's very prevalent, and we are still learning so much about trauma. In fact, uh, the DSM-5, the latest diagnostic statistical manual, which is this book that psychiatrists utilize to treat and diagnose mental health concerns, believe it or not, does not recognize racial trauma as an acceptable experience for post-traumatic stress disorder unless it is related to a specific physical assault. And this is with the most up-to-date edition, which came out in 2013. I share this because this undermines the experience of millions of people in, the, in this nation who have suffered emotional and spiritual abuse due to racism. Dr. Monica Williams writes, this is problematic given that many minorities experience cumulative experiences of racism as traumatic. Moreover, existing PTSD measures aimed at identifying trauma typically fail to include racism among listed choice options, leading such events to be reported as other or squeezed into another existing category that may not fully capture the nature of the trauma. So this is crucial as, as people of faith. We need to think about this because trauma has been acknowledged by our society and even our churches in very specific ways, limiting the full acknowledgement of what trauma is for many. This takes true empathy and compassion to consider how others might be hurt deeply by something that may never impact you directly. 
we have reserved trauma for war, abuse, structural violence, and other very real traumatic events, but faith communities have a moral responsibility to hear, acknowledge, and consider how others have experienced trauma. And so why should faith communities address trauma? That's the, the big question before we get to how to become, all, do all this work. So why should faith communities care about this? Every congregation worshiping community almost definitely has a person that has had trauma, whether has or had trauma, whether as a child or into adulthood, uh, trauma is very common. In fact, there are churches, faith communities led by ministers, deacons, and all types of people who have had trauma. There are also children who come to faith communities for church, after school activities, vacation Bible school, daycare, childcare, community service, etc., that are experiencing trauma or will experience trauma. And even a greater number of those will know others that experience trauma, therefore needing to know how to respond with compassion. So in short, we want to equip and grow an awareness of self and others, and that is why a faith community should be trauma-informed. Uh, trauma must be treated because of the increase of the physiological and mental uh, symptoms of trauma are, are life-changing, and, and, and there's lots of those reasons, and there's deep risk for individual and community trauma. And so all of these concerns are uh, concerns of a community and of families and individuals, but also uh, they are concerns of God. I truly believe that. And, and if they're concerns of God, then they are concerns of the local faith community. Uh, next slide, please. So what is uh, trauma-informed care? Trauma-informed care can lead to healthy and productive ministry within a faith community. So I'm offering different working definitions of this phrase with hopes of opening up an abundance of ways that a faith community can join this work. Uh, this is a big topic. Uh, there are a lot of ways of joining this work, work which offers great flexibility in joining. Uh, Trauma-informed care is about practicing what's called universal trauma precaution. This is a phrase, a, a, a common phrase in this work. Universal trauma precautions means engaging with all people as if they have experienced trauma. And so this is really crucial work with a faith community. It level, it's a level ground, so to speak. Treat others uh, all the same as, as if someone has had a, a hard, season or experience in their past, and, and whether that's true or not, uh, it will invite safety and mutual collaboration. So trauma-informed care is a, considered a strength-based approach that fosters uh, recovery and healing through safe and collaborative relationships. Trauma often hurts trust as episodes of trauma violate safety and trust giving way to further negative experiences. The main goal then is to not inadvertently re-traumatize those we are doing ministry with while fostering collaborative care and creating a place of mutual trust. Uh, SAMHSA, which is an organization, another resource you'll see, SAMHSA means Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Association, says that the core components of trauma-informed care include safety, transparency, mutuality, which means engaging in decision-making, empowering others with choice, sensitivity to cultural, historical, and gender issues, including racism and structural violence and community collective trauma. And with that, I will add, uh, Considering, this is a good point to consider how for many, even entering a faith community or a place of worship can be difficult in itself. Uh, so a lot to consider here. Uh, next question, please. I mean, next slide, please. <laughs> okay, what is a trauma-informed faith community? 
So we take all this, this is a lot of groundwork, and I know, I know that uh, we take all this and we bring it all together to help us understand what is ideally a trauma-informed faith community. And as a faith community that shares life together, learns and worships together, eats together, grieves together, raises children, um, Mary provides spiritual formation for people of all ages, there's an abundance of opportunity for our faith community to address trauma and be sensitive to trauma's role in the lives of the people that make up a community. So trauma-informed care essentially realizes the impact of trauma and integrates knowledge about trauma, empowers community members to acknowledge the hard experiences they have experienced uh, as trauma, including ACEs, again, adverse childhood experiences, and how high stress and trauma can become biologically embedded. So being a trauma-informed faith community means Realizing how trauma affects people, realizing the widespread impact of trauma, those uh, deeply distressing and emotional experiences leave long lasting effects and provide and providing practical ministry interventions as well as support for ongoing mental health uh, interventions through uh, professional referrals and support from uh, mental health trained professionals. Secondly, recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma in children and youth and adults all ages and ministering to those as well as the effects of living with uh, a traumatized individual has on all relationships, uh, marriage, family, work, social. So recognizing the signs and symptoms uh, the best that we can as lay people uh, and, and with that, staying in relationship with those folks and, and and walking alongside them. And number and three, responding to the need within its worshiping community and the needs of its neighbors uh, by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into church and ministry policies, procedures, and ministry practices. We'll get into this a little deeper later on, but essentially we want to take all this and, and change the way we do church, uh, incorporate it. It's one thing to know it. Again, it's another thing to practice it. And we seek to actively resist re-traumatization that can occur when um, recognition and intervention does not happen with compassion or faith communities practices around touch, for instance, physical touch, or group norms may impede on a person's boundaries or levels of comfort. Uh, again, we'll get into this a little later again, but in the meantime, re-traumatization can happen even with most earnest intentions. So we want to talk about trauma, we want to address trauma. We have to know that as we're guiding these conversations and doing life with people, it can bring up a difficult moments. So the, the, our goal though should not be to re-traumatize by uh, practices like um, like hugging and physical touch, as I mentioned, and things that, unless we know, is a mutual consenting practice. So we'll get into that. But uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. So steps and ideas of becoming a trauma-informed faith community. So this is more guidance from uh, the organization SAMHSA, guiding concepts to consider as becoming a trauma-informed faith community. So consider the following. We've already kind of gone over some of these, but I, I don't think there's an end to hearing it. We can't hear it enough. Safety, not just physical safety, but emotional and relational safety as well. Is there a structure, consider these things as I talk, is there a structure in place that allows vulnerable people to feel included and protected within the worshiping community? So for instance, consider power dynamics in your church uh, faith community and how it might feel to be a vulnerable person in your faith community or feel vulnerable at least. So think about everything from pastoral visits uh, to divorce care, to child care, to being in need of food or money, uh, gas, whatever it may be. Try as hard as we can to consider what would it be like to be in need 
would you feel comfortable in your faith community in that power dynamic? And that's a good way, to, a litmus test for this, for safety, to see if uh, your, our faith communities are practicing genuine uh, safety. Secondly, trustworthiness and transparency. Uh, authenticity, is that a characteristic highly valued within your faith community? Are uh, confidences kept? Does unintentional sharing of information happen, even with good intentions? Uh, for example, with like a prayer chain or a prayer group. Now, I understand that many, majority of the time, prayers are shared openly and with and for with purpose. But sometimes, sometimes things might get shared uh, unintentionally. It wasn't meant to be a public prayer request. It might have been um, intended to be an unspoken prayer request. To use that example. So just a quick check. Just think about it in the life of your church and. This is, and if your church faith community doesn't follow all this all the time, that just means we're, we're being human. So I also meant to preface with that. Third, mutual support. Does the church go beyond being friendly to being a place where someone can make friendships? So what I mean by that is can I traumatize a person with traumatic experiences find a listening ear and welcome with others that are walking the same road of healing and, and finding ways to uh, nurture self-compassion. Can this happen in large groups and small groups? And also are ministry leaders modeling this as well? Are they modeling self-care? Are ministry leaders modeling self-compassion in, in, through their own personal practices? In collaboration, uh, this is another word for mutuality. Does the church view its ministry to individuals with uh, trauma and vulnerable children, for instance, as integral, integral as to its call to work, kingdom work of God? Or is it simply a, a um, thing that we're just doing, rolling through the motions, uh, a niche, for instance? Can the church work with others even across ideological and denominational lines for the betterment of hurting people? Or so, is it about the church or the egos, or is it about listening and being with those that have been deeply hurt by life? I pinpoint this, and I appreciate SAMHSA bringing it up, because uh, some who have experienced trauma are particularly vulnerable to power dynamics. So this is a good check in with uh, how we're doing our ministry. Next, empowerment, voice, and choice. Are those that ministered to also given opportunity and empowered to serve within the church, understanding that they bring value and wisdom to the worshiping community? Are they fully integrated into the life of the faith community and given a voice for self-advocacy? So empowerment, voice, and choice. I really love the choice part of this. It's, it's, in, it's in radical inclusion. Um, it offers uh, a chance to be involved if people want to choose to do that. I, so I, it's, a good, it's a good suggestion. And then lastly, cultural, historical, and gender issues. Does the church, your faith community, recognize unique cultural issues often bound up with trauma within the context of what has defined your worshiping community is there room for the expression of faith and practice in ways that honor the unique cultural historical and gender backgrounds of those you seek to serve great so we're ready for the next slide and i know i'm coming up on the end of my time but this is this is a great these are these are i think what a lot of the people here are wanting Practical ways for a faith community to be a trauma-informed place of worship. But this is the, the hard work, you know, it's all hard work, but, you know, we, we try to understand trauma, we try to understand individual and community trauma, what does it mean to provide trauma-informed care, whether you're a teacher, a social worker, a pastor, whoever, a grandparent, uh, and then we take all that knowledge, and, and this is where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. So one way, uh, I'm going to list a bunch of ways, but faith communities are uniquely positioned to address trauma because many of our topics that we naturally deal with in faith conversations include hope, despair, guilt, 
shame, um, having a feeling a low sense of worth, bitterness. And so with this productive language is crucial. Uh, a church, a way a church can practice this is practice language that destigmatizes trauma and overall mental health concerns, inviting people to feel comfortable, safe, and empowered to trust while holding their experiences. So this means whole and first person language. Uh, do not use diagnosis as adjectives. For instance, sometimes you might hear someone say, uh, he is bipolar or something like that. She is so bipolar, a throwaway comment like that. It's incredibly damaging. Uh, and so we, the way we talk about this is, is, is imperative in establishing trust. So other ways, communities and other local groups tend to trust church and faith community sponsored events. So if a faith community takes this lead in informing how to talk productively around this, around ACEs and trauma, it'll be, it'll, it'll, uh, have a ripple effect into the larger community and people will notice this. I promise they will. And I want to bring up a study that happened uh, from Hawkins and Catalano. They had three elements to help children move from risk to resiliency. Those, those were a caring, nurturing environment, high expectations, and a meaningful engagement. In other words, relationships, common language, and purposeful activities. So that was crucial in understanding how to bring this language down so people utilize it and they feel empowered to use it. And then when we get the language uh, more solid or cleaned up, I should say, worship can reflect that. And you can have special worship themes on ACEs and destigmatizing language around trauma, being very intentional about whole person language, and understand that preaching from certain passages might need extra sensitivity. And so, uh, this helps empower people to talk about what's really going on if they feel led to uh, and can bring up um, and, and, and promote resiliency in our local faith community. Also want to highlight staff trainings, leadership trainings for clergy, of course, Stevens ministers, uh, deacons, pastoral care team, preschool teachers in your church, all types of Sunday school teachers. Two that I want to really highlight, one is mental health first aid. That's a great overview of just trying to understand the different mental health concerns that people uh, hold every day, day in and day out. This is a great course. Another course is called Connections Matters Training, and that's focused on trauma and ACEs. And that would be a wonderful resource for any training, leadership, uh, congregational, whatever it may be. And that would also help inform other ministries, including Vacation Bible School and Children's Ministries. And with the language and with these trainings, it will ultimately help break down toxic theology. You know, the, the pray more about it theology, the bootstrap philosophy that can lead to isolation, uh, and, and it also can contribute to secret culture uh, because people may not feel comfortable to share what is actually going on. So going back to the need for transparency. So taking, dismantling uh, toxic theology. Uh, also a church faith community can realize how much of our life is spent in other arenas, work, school, uh, extracurricular sports teams. I understand COVID is a different time right now. Uh, but with that, a, a faith community really can work in tandem with other uh, community organizations, and that is that that would benefit everyone, including the faith community in itself. Uh, working, collaborating, learning with other organizations would only provide more insights and more considerations as we're doing this work together. And let's see here. Also, I have to highlight a great resource called the Resilience Resilience Film: Resilience, the Biology of Stress and the Science of Hope. You can host a screening of this film at your faith community. It's a great uh, 101 look at trauma and ACEs. And also I wanna promote learning from a trauma-informed church. You can, there's churches and faith communities doing this work who've already had experience doing this work. Go visit or have a virtual Zoom meeting, I should say, and see how they're promoting resilience, how they're promoting therapy, self-care, uh, disconnecting from devices, turning towards non-judgment, 
practicing self-compassion, see what works for them. And of course, I want to highlight my organization, Partners in Health and Wholeness. We have funding to help with this. We also have plenty of resources. You have a, a wonderful staff. I know I'm biased, but my colleagues are great people. And you have me to call up and say, hey, I'm thinking about starting a mental health ministry. I want to start uh, a trauma-informed curriculum for our Sunday schools, whatever it may be. We would love to work with you, talk with you, and you, you might apply uh, for one of our grants to help fund this work. And lastly, I know I went over, I'm sorry, team, but this is crucial, a faith community, and we already talked about the power dynamics that a faith community has, but you have to consider uh, community trauma, such as gun violence, collective loss, uh, the natural disasters that we've talked about. Here's an idea, too. I thought about this. It would be awesome if a faith community together did a church-wide study of your local area's history. So look closely at statistics around violence and poverty, education levels, uh, police brutality, and more, and consider all this with compassion. I think that would be so informative, uh, and it would help just provide even more compassion as we do this work together. So those are just a couple of examples of ways that a faith community can do this work. And um, I'm happy to talk with more. I'm happy to talk with you in launching this work. And uh, if you remember anything from this conversation today, just know PHW is so honored to work with you all. You all are incredible and the work that you are doing is so important. Everybody on this call is a, is a um, agent of change and with that, we are so grateful to partner with you, and thank you for your time joining me. Uh, the next slide, I probably should already put it up, uh, Lindsay, resources. I just go ahead and see that you will see that first article is the one from the Prevention Institute. I highly recommend reading that. That's online. It's free. Connections Matters is the training I mentioned. Smart Start is a wonderful organization that talks about ACEs as well as Prevent Child Abuse and C. Resilience is a documentary film that I mentioned. ACES Connection is great. SAMHSA, I talked a lot from SAMHSA's resources today. Institute for Collective Trauma and Growth uh, works alongside faith communities and they have resources for faith communities. And Mental Health First Aid is that training that I mentioned, gives a good insight, uh, an airplane view, if you will, of how a faith community and we all can work towards destigmatizing mental health. And again, just thank you for your time. We'll leave this slide up just a couple more seconds. And then the next slide, I will have uh, my contact information. And I will also put that in the chat. Please feel free to reach out to me. And again, I'm, I'm clergy. I'm not a uh, licensed mental health professional. But I am doing my best to connect faith community with this work. So thank you as we learn together. Thank you so much, so, so much, Jessica, for all of that. Um, now we're going to move in to a brief question and answer section. I think we have about five, six minutes for this, and we already have a couple questions. Um, I just wanted to confirm just through the chat, we've already been getting requests for a list of these resources, and um, we will be sending that out with a recording of, of today's webinar. And um, and I think that if, if we want to send the slides out, if that's something that people are interested in, we can absolutely do that as well. Um, a couple of the questions that we've already gotten, and they were towards the beginning of your uh, presentation, Jessica, but the first one was from Keaton Hill. Does ACEs take into account trauma that occurs to an individual's mother during pregnancy? Oh, wow. Gosh. Yeah. Um, that that's, a, a that's a great question. Um, please, the rest of my team, if you do know the answer, uh, please chime in. I'm not fully confident in answering that. I do know that the first 2,000 days, that, I know that's a tricky wording. If I understand it right, it, it's considered the, the birth because that's when you're exposed to environmental stimulus and whatnot. Uh, it's, it's a phrasing uh, of their choice. But that's a great question. I would assume that they would include that uh, because of the different dynamics that how stress can be carried from a mother in vitro and mm -hmm. post birth. Mm -hmm. And so uh, 
if any of my team want to confirm that or or maybe I'm wrong. I'm sorry that I don't know that with full confidence. But I from hey, the Jeff. basic training I have, that sounds that that seems like it might be what they would say. Hey, Jessica? Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Chris. Um, hey, everybody. We, I actually was looking into this as well. Nicole Johnson and I have just recently started working more closely with the North Carolina Institute of Medicine, and um, they are expanding the definition to consider um, maternal uh, events during pregnancy. And we actually have an article that we're going to drop into the chat box that will give a little bit more information on that. And we'll also add that to the resources that go out if that's helpful. Great. Th thanks, Chris. Yeah, I knew my team, we're, we're all working on this together. Thank you. Of course. Another question that we got um, earlier on in your presentation was from Sally McLeod Owens, and it says, why does individual trauma include only adverse childhood experiences, grown-ups experience personal trauma in abundance? Yes. Sorry, I didn't mean for my PowerPoint to uh, deter from that. I thousand percent agree with you. I was sharing, I used the APA's definition of uh, trauma to encompass all ages, and I, I, I should have done a better job of highlighting that I was including adult trauma in that, because yes, a hundred percent, I agree with you. I, I included ACEs as, and I think I mentioned, there's a lot of categories of trauma. I think I mentioned that. I included ACEs because uh, I wanted to highlight that one form of uh, trauma-informed care that is happening amongst many, and because I know many of our faith communities are talking about ACEs, and so I'm sorry that I wasn't clear. I totally, uh, I mentioned in the APA, well, the APA definition talks about different forms of trauma that adults endure, so, so yeah. Um, and now I'm gonna, um, oh, there's a question um, in the chat. Um, Leah Chalberg says, uh, thank you so much. I have worked at several United Methodist churches, all of which who have had to navigate significant change, typically change from transitioning out of old mindsets and how church is done into a new ones. As I look back, I can see how those changes were experienced as traumatic by church members and leaders. And I wish we would have been able to think of that change management through the lens of trauma. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you have any resources around trauma-informed change management, change leadership in organizations or faith communities that you might recommend. Uh, that's a really interesting question. So trauma-informed change management. So what I'm hearing is, um, and we were talking about this yesterday as a team even, the way the, the polity, the way we do our sort of the admin and administrative side of things, but also the, just the culture of our faith communities and the office, the internal work, and so forth. Let me see what I have. I'm, I'm writing down your name, Leah. Yes, uh, I am too. I am too. And we will follow up with you, but for the others, because I understand that they won't have correspondence with us. I was just actually meeting with a faith community this morning, St. Paul's in Cary, North Carolina, and they were talking about how they started with baby steps, showing the resilience film, which led then to the preschool director utilizing this knowledge and, and helping the teachers understand it, and then the teachers then took everything and shared it with the parents. Mm -hmm. And so I, I share that as encouragement. Um, I know all of us, a lot of us look back and think, wow, I could have done it differently if I only had known about this. And so please don't feel alone in that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's amazing how one small, seemingly small uh, addition to your ministry, whether it's the resilience film or having uh, destigmatizing language in our ministry, how a seemingly small change can have such productive uh, abundance of compassion with that within the larger ministry. So let me think on specifically what you're talking about, but I offer that to the rest. There's a couple more questions coming in, but I also, um, we will definitely be keeping track of the chat and the questions as they come in. I'm also going to make it possible for our participants to unmute themselves if they want to ask a question. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And if no one speaks up, then I'll read these questions in the chat. So I'm allowing participants to unmute themselves now. 
and just be mindful of background noise as you ask your question. We only have a couple more minutes. And as people are thinking, I just want to address, hey, Christina, Christina is a dear friend of mine uh, and colleague. I will, uh, you bring up LGBTQ affirming uh, and marginalized groups. And so that is a huge part of trauma work to go back to the original question, adults very much uh, experience trauma. That's, that was my intention with raising racism and uh, as well with LGBTQ. So, so let me talk one-on-one -on -one with you, but there are resources around uh, trauma and LGBTQ. Does anyone else have any questions they would like to bring to this space? Well, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat. We'll make sure to address them in our follow-up emails. Uh, also, feel free to email Jessica or anybody on the team, and we will make sure that we're compiling those questions and sending those out. Now, I, um, I wanted to let you all know that we do have a poll that we're going to be launching in just a couple, minute, a couple seconds with two questions, and we really appreciate any and all feedback you all are willing to give us because the responses that we gather are really going to guide us in the development of our content as we are moving forward with the Sacred Conversation series. So um, I am launching the poll now. And um, there are two questions. Make sure that it's, you scroll down to see the second question. Um, and we will also, in just a few minutes, have my colleague, Nicole Johnson, close us out. Disappeared too quickly. All right, while well, everyone is finishing up, um, we'll just take a few minutes um, to kind of center ourselves and take a few minutes to quiet down. And what I'd like to do is uh, take a few moments to, I'm going to call it uh, breathing into this moment. That was a lot of information. And even though I've heard some of this before, I'm just going to say like my brain just kind of exploded and there's a lot going on in there. So we're going to take a minute and then we're going to take some deep breaths. Um, all the things that you're thinking about, whether or not you felt like your church is trauma informed community or not, or whether you feel like you've done things that were like not uh, very trauma informed in your community. I'm going to invite you to, or you were somebody who's experienced trauma. Um, I'm going to invite you to just take a moment and we're going to take one minute and we're going to breathe and we're going to be quiet. And then I'll just say a few words of closing. If you're somebody who it's important to feel centered in your body, I invite you to place your feet flat on the ground. I invite you to open up your chest as you take deep breaths in and out. I invite you to open your arms and your hands. I 
I invite you to imagine that the things that you are holding, as you open your hands, imagine that you're holding them less tightly, less anxiously. If you're someone who it helps you to close your eyes to be able to bring yourself into a moment, I invite you to do that. If you're somebody for whom opening your eyes is better, I invite you to do that as well. A couple more deep breaths. All right, thank you everyone for participating and uh, being on the call today. I know that was a lot of information. There was a lot coming at you. Um, there is gonna be a part two, July 24th at 11 a.m. Um, I think Michelle has a couple closing things. Maybe not. She's looking at me. No, no, she doesn't. Okay, so what's going to happen um, as we've done for our other calls, and I guess this is becoming a PHW sacred conversations tradition, um, I'm going to unmute everyone and everybody can say goodbye or hello and goodbye at the same time. Um, and we're going to be closing out. Thank you for being with us today.